We have come to the final week of our dedicated journey through the book of James. And I would like to take a moment to extend my heartfelt appreciation to all of you who have joined us from the start. Now, your commitment to this Rhema Bible reading movement uh, has been an excellent example of your devotions to spiritual growth. And I hope it has been an enriching and transformative experience for you. How do I live out holy love in prayer and worship? Now, this is the title, or rather the topic, for this week's devotion. Today, we explore James 5, a passage that serves as a guide for embracing this transformative love in our prayer and worship. And I trust that as we unpack this passage, we will uncover ways to apply its teachings in practical ways and meaning, practical and meaningful ways. Now, first of all, we want to thank God for James. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who spent the latter years of his life praying for the churches God was raising up. When he died, when James died and his body was prepared for burial, it was found that his knees was so hard from hours, from many hours of kneeling that they almost resembled the knees of a camel. And he became known as camel knees. The fourth century Christian scholar and bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius, wrote the first comprehensive history of the church. And he testified in Book 2, Chapter 23, Paris 6, that his knees, he here meaning James, his knees became hard like those of a camel in consequence of his constantly bending them in his worship of God and asking forgiveness for the people. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, also known as Camel Knees. The idea of praying on our knees is mentioned frequently in Scripture. Praying on our knees conveys humility and awe. It conveys an appropriate sense of who we are and who God is. Getting down on our knees tells us in a very tangible way, through the posture of our bodies, it tells us that something different is occurring in our experience that requires something different from our bodies. As one commentator writes, kneeling in prayer communicates something vitally important. What is that? We recognize that God is everything for us and that without his merciful love, we are literally nothing. We recognize that God is everything for us and that without his merciful love, we are literally nothing. Indeed, James had walked the talk. He practices what he preached. As your pastor, as I prepare this passage, I want to confess I didn't pray as much as I ought to. Some of you maybe start to have got distracted and think that, ha. Oh, Luckily, my pastor also like that. If you read James from the beginning, you joined us in this Rima Bible reading movement, and you know. Watch our tongue. There are many things, many topics that James taught us. And 
one of the topic is prayer. Right from the beginning in chapter one, he said, if you lack wisdom, pray. When come to the end of the letters, he touched on prayer again. So he, he lived a life, a prayerful life. He walked the talk, he practiced what he preached. And so how do we live our holy love in prayer and worship? I want you to see four things in this passage. First, we must aware, we must remember, we must know that a Christian life is one of communion with God. And prayer is an expression of holy love. A Christian life is one of communion with God, and prayer is an expression of holy love. John Wesley, our father, in one of his sermons titled The Marks of the New Birth, he said, the chief design of religion is to renew our lost communion with God. The chief design of religion is, re is to renew our lost communion with God. In today's passage, verse 13 depicts the praying Christian. James' message is very clear. In every circumstances of life, every circumstances of life, pray. Listen to what he says. Is anyone among you in trouble? What's the response? Pray. Is anyone happy? I see Ernie smiling, must be happy. Is anyone happy? What's the proper response? Let him sing praises. All right? Let him sing praises. James responds to suffering, to the sufferings of Christians. Note. It's not simply to say, be patient. If you remember the passage earlier, last week, from chapter 5, verse 7 onwards, the heading there is patience in suffering. Patience in suffering. But here, today's passage, let us know that James doesn't stop there. Hey, be patient. If you are suffering, be patient. And that's it. No. He continued. Is anyone suffering in trouble? Pray. That's how we can maintain, endure, and persevere. Doesn't so it's a very good advice to us all when we want to minister to anyone who is suffering. Don't just tell them and stop there. Be patient. Wait until the Lord's coming. No. Pray. Pray. You know why? From the start, remember Reverend Jasper shared with us about tongue. If anyone here is suffering, we, we are, our tendency is to complain, blame, accuse, stuff like that, and speak of evil, speak of unrighteous things that is not pleasing in the sight of God. How can we control our time? The time you spend complaining, let me advise you, spend the time, pray, come before God, turn to God, tell Him about your trouble. Understand? So James' response to suffering, Christians, is not simply to say, be patient, hang there, hang on, but rather to practically you entrust yourself to the care of the Almighty God. And that's the only one way to do that. That is, pray. Pray. His point is, prayer is always appropriate. It is always appropriate to pray. Pray. Communion with God. No matter what is happening in life, we should pray and praise God. And why? Because the Christian life is to be consecrated by prayer to God. So that every pleasure, every pleasure that we enjoy is hallow. H-A-L-L-O-W. 
unless I pronounce it wrongly. Hello, am I right? Good, thank you. And every pain is sanctified. So the best, this is the best ring of our time. Pray, come to the Lord, ask him for wisdom, seek him for help. So God wants us to talk to him at all times. In trouble, he's our comforter. In joy, he is the giver of all joy. And in going to him in prayer, we hallow every pleasure and we sanctify every pain. The whole of Christian life is one of communion with God, manifested in prayer. When life storms threaten to overwhelm us, where do we turn? James reminds us that in times of suffering, we can find solace in prayer. Our prayerful communion with God during these moments isn't just a, a desperate plea, but it is an acknowledgement of our dependence on His love and grace. And equally important is the aspect of joyful praise. When we experience moments of happiness, our hearts naturally overflow with gratitude. Singing praises to God isn't just an emotional release, but it is a tangible expression of holy love. It is an intentional act of holy love. It's a way of saying, God, I recognize your goodness and I celebrate it. And when sickness knocks at our door, verse 50, we are called to community. The elders of the church and the anointing with oil symbolize the power of communal prayer. This collective act of Holy love reaches beyond ourselves, demonstrating that our faith is not just about salvation, personal salvation, but also about caring for one another in times of need. So verse 13 to 15, let's remember, a Christian life is one of communion with God and prayer is the expressions of holy love. How do we live out holy love in prayer and worship? In all circumstances, what? Louder, please. Pray. Now, how do we live out holy love in prayer and worship? The second Second thing is confession and accountability, foundations of holy love. Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now note the word, therefore, okay? Know the word, therefore. Our church, although confession to God is the most necessary form of confession, right? Confession to God, just as Psalms 51 verse 4, David came and confess his sin. Confession to God is the most necessary form of confession. But any genuine Godward repentance, any gen genuine Godward repentance will be mirrored in relationship within the Christian community. I repeat, although Christ Although confession to God is the most necessary form of confession, yes, we need to confess to God. But any genuine Godward repentance 
will be mirrored or reflected in the relationship within the Christian community. So believers should not only confess their sins to those who have, whom they have wronged, they should also confess their secret sins of pride, lust, resentment and greed to a trusted fellow believer or believers in a small group. Now such confession, James tells us, will result in spiritual, if not physical, healing. Confession is a hum humble act that opens the door to holy love. It is a recognition of our imperfections, and, but at the same time, a courageous step forward to take accountability. And James encourages us to confess our sins to one another. This is not about public shaming. All right? But it is about creating a space of vulnerability, authenticity, and accountability. No Christian life is journey alone. When we open up about our struggles, even for pastors, Leaders, when we open up about our struggles, confess our sins to one another, and seek forgiveness, we foster an atmosphere of authenticity. Love must be genuine. And so when we come together, confess our sins to one another, we foster an atmosphere of authenticity where growth and healing can take place. And this practice reflects God's love as he welcomes us all with open arms when we turn to him in honesty. Remember, if I hide any sin in me, God will not listen to my prayer. And confession is an act of love towards ourselves, others, and God. I want to pause for a moment. Brothers and sisters, spend a moment. Ask yourself, is there someone you need to reconcile with or confess to? Is there someone you need to reconcile with or confess to? Close your eyes. Come humbly before God. May God search our hearts. Speak to us. Convict us. Is there someone you need to reconcile with or confess to? between siblings, between spouse, between fellow colleagues, employer and employee relationships, what practical steps can you take to initiate that process?
And I trust that you will pray about it. And James goes on to remind us the prayer of a righteous person holds great power. When we pray for one another, especially in the context of confessions and intercessions, brothers and sisters, we tap into a wellspring of holy love. When we, come, when we pray for one another, especially in the context of confessions and intercessions. We tap into a wellspring of holy life. And our, our prayer becomes instruments of healing, restoration, and renewal, affecting not only our lives, but the lives of those that we lift up in prayer. Earlier, I asked all to take note of therefore, the word therefore. In verse 15, second part of verse 15, it implied there's someone who was sick because of sin. And so, They, were, they require, they need the elders to pray over them. The word therefore here remind us not to wait until things get worse. Pray. Come together as a community. Confess our sins to one another and pray. And that's why the next verse, or rather, the next part of it, James reminds us that the prayer of righteous person are effective. We don't have to wait until we are sick on the bed. Then we require an elder to come with anointing oil. Pray for us. No. In our community, we should practice. We should live out a holy love. Come together, pray for one another, confess, intercede for one another. And so this is my understanding of this passage here. How to live out holy love in prayer and worship. In every circumstances, pray. And we also come together to confess and pray for one another as a community. And the third thing is fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Trusting God's plan. Verse 17 to 18. Now the story of Elijah reminds us that fervent prayer carries with. It's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. Now it is not we don't see, in fact, we don't see Elijah uh, raising his, his uh, voice to God or increase the volume of his words when he come before God and pray. So fervent prayer is not about the volume of words, but the intensity of our trust. It is not about shouting. It is about a heart that is earnest, that is undistracted and fully surrendered to God. Holy love is evident when we surrender to God's will, trusting that His plans are greater than ours. And it demonstrates that our belief it demonstrates our belief that God is willing, is both willing and able to answer according to His wisdom, to His wisdom. So when we under trial, we find ourselves lack of wisdom. We seek God for His wisdom so that we can see things from God's perspective 
And as we continue to pray, to seek Him, then we will align more and more, we will align with God's will for us. And we will appreciate God's pleasing will and purpose for us. So when we pray with righteousness and faith, we align ourselves with God's will. Holy love is seen in our unwavering trust, even when circumstances seem bleak. Like Elijah, we are called to pray, not merely for our desires, but in accordance with God's greater plan. And so for some thinking, where did Elijah pray about the rain, for the rain? Now, if you go back to 1 Kings 18, verse 1, Elijah, in fact, prayed according to God's will. Because it was God who asked him to go to Ahab and tell him that there will be rain. All right? And so he went, tell him, and pray about it. All right? So he is praying according to God's will. Since mid-September, we begin a sermon series on Lord's Prayer for our Indonesian service. And this morning, I shared about the first petitions of the Lord's Prayer. That is, hallowed be your name. I hope you all know the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's next? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Now, these three petitions, we must note the order of the petitions in this Lord's Prayer. The first three petitions have to do with God and with the glory of God. And then after that, the second three petitions have to do with our needs and our necessities. And that is to say, God is first given his supreme place, and then, only then, do we turn to ourselves and our needs and desires. It is only when God is given his proper place that all other things fall into their proper place. Prayer must never be an attempt to bend the will of God to suit us to our desires. A prayer ought always to be an attempt to submit our wills to the will of God. Prayer. So fervent prayer is to completely trust God's plan for us. Not to bend the will of God to our desires. So the questions for us today, brothers and sisters, what practices or habits can you incorporate into your life to help you stay focused on God's will in your prayers? What practices or habits can you incorporate into your life to help you stay focused on God's will in your prayers? The last, the last thing is restoring the wanderer. It is a ministry of holy love, verse 19 to 20. In these final verses, we encounter a call to restore those who have wandered from the truth. This act of holy love requires stepping out of our comfort zone. It is not a judgmental, it is not judgmental, but reflects God's relentless pursuit of his children. This act of holy love requires compassion, not condemnation. Our role is to gently guide those who have strayed back to the path of truth, reminding them of the Father's, our Father's unwavering love. 
So again, my question is to you, brothers and sisters. Today, is there someone in your life who has wandered spiritually? Is there someone in your life who has wandered spiritually? Your wife, your spouse, your children, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? How can you reach out to them with compassion and understanding? Maybe I can bring you back to earlier on confessions and, and intercessions and accountability. Now, as pastors, I pray, or I hope to see that fellow brothers and sisters, you belong, there's someone that you can confide in. You belong to a small group or at least you find one or two brothers or sisters in Christ where you can share, confide in, where there's an atmosphere of authenticity, where you can share your challenges and struggles. If not, this is what will happen, a wanderer. A wanderer out there. He could be someone previously in his early life here worshipping with us. But today he is a wanderer. And one of the reasons could be he do not feel safe to share his challenge. Just like kids. Today my son is here. Sometimes I'm worried because if he not to share with me, I ask myself, have I created an atmosphere for him, a safe environment for him so that he can share, he can come forth about his challenges, struggles, anything? Do we have such a community ready? If not, verse 19 and 20, there you see the wanderer. They could be previously from us here. All right? So here, our role is to gently guide those who have strayed back to the path of truth, reminding them of the Father's unwavering love. Brothers and sisters, is there someone in your life who has wandered spiritually? Not only on the, not only this doctrine, but the relationship in Christ. Was he condemned? Was he judged? Restorations involve covering a multitude of sins with love and grace. Just as the father embraced the prodigal son, we are called to embody holy love by extending forgiveness and acceptance. So our pursuit of wandering, wandering, mirrors the heart of God who longs for reconciliation and restoration. So the last question that I would like to ask is, how can you extend forgiveness and grace to others, especially those who may have wronged you or gone astray. As we conclude our journey through James 5, 13, 20, let's reflect on the truths we have explored, leaving out holy love in prayer and worship isn't a passive endeavor. It is transformative lifestyle. It is about turning to God in all circumstances, offering authentic praise, supporting one another in sickness, confessing our shortcomings, praying fervently and reaching out to restore those 
who have lost their way. So, may we internalize these teachings, allow them to shape our daily interactions with God and others, and we embrace holy love. As we embrace holy love, we become instruments of divine grace, radiate God's love in every aspect of our lives. Amen, yes. So let's go, go forth with hearts of, full of holy love, knowing that through our prayers and worship, we can experience a deeper connection with God and impact the world around us. And so may the holy love of God continue to shape us all, guide us, and draw us closer to the heart of our loving Creator. Amen.